Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Josh. I do a lot of videos on IT, cybersecurity, career and education type things. And this video is just going to be a continuation of the cybersecurity interview question. So I'll just get right into it really quick here. So the next question is explain what data leakage is. So essentially what data leakage is, is when you have some kind of data like protected or otherwise, usually something that you don't want to get out. You have some you have some data and it somehow makes its way outside of your organization. Maybe either like somebody stole it or maybe the employees purposely or unintentionally exfiltrated it or like removed it from the organization some way. And now it's kind of exposed and people have it who are not supposed to have it. So this question is pretty simple and the answer is pretty simple. I, I feel like I probably could have answered it in a more eloquent way to have like a good answer. Maybe you can even give an, a real world example of some data leakage that happened, uh, at some time, but pretty straightforward question for the most part. Yeah, that's it. Uh, data leakage. And the next question is list out the high level steps involved in a successful data loss prevention product project. So data loss prevention or DLP for short. So the high level steps in a DLP project for me, it would include like data identification. So you kind of have to have an inventory of what you actually have. Otherwise, like how are you going to prevent it from uh, being leaked or, or lost in some way. So first of all, data identification, whether it's like manual or an automated process, depending on the system you're talking about. And then next you would have data classification because not all data is, you know, equal. Some of them uh, could be like public record where, you know, it doesn't really matter. So it doesn't matter so much that it gets leaked or it could be, you know, sensitive or it could be PII or it could be some kind of regulated data like cardholder data or electronic protected health information or criminal justice information or any of these kind of data that are protect protected at, at different levels. So you have to classify the data to kind of make sure like which one you want, which one you want to protect, like which one is super critical and which one's not. And then you have to identify the potential like exfiltration vector. So for example, depending on your org, this could be like a lot different, but if your stuff is in the cloud, you kind of have to consider how you can move stuff or, or exfiltrate or otherwise get it off the cloud. And if you're kind of more of an on-premise or a hybrid type business, you would have to consider things like printing or emails or, or thumb drives or this type of thing. So figure out like all the different um, data loss vectors, like how data can get out of the organization and kind of think about how to set up checkpoints for those areas. And then kind of the next really high level step is defining thresholds for things. So for example, it may not be normal for somebody to move like 2000 sensitive records from the computer onto the thumb drive. So depending on like if you're using a software or something, you may want to consider thresholds for warning, like warning the cybersecurity people like who are implementing the plan or monitoring it. Consider thresholds for warning and then consider thresholds for blocking for all the different loss vectors, if this makes sense. So again, there's kind of a lot of different ways you can answer this. Um, I actually did stand up a DLP project. That's just what I did when I was standing up mine. There might be like a, an official kind of framework or something like a method to properly do it, but I, I don't know what that is. Um, that's just kind of how I would have answered um, if somebody were to ask me this. Again, I probably could have answered it more, more eloquently. It just, I think my answer was like pretty decent to be honest, but again, there's like so many different directions that you could go with it. So maybe like look up this question and maybe you could take my answer and like expand on it or make it better or something. Uh, but yeah, that is DLP. So the next question is explain phishing and how it can be prevented. Uh, so phishing is basically just tricking somebody one way or another to kind of trick them into doing something, whether it's like installing malware or like giving them credentials or just tricking them to do something that allows you to launch some kind of cyber attack or gain some kind of information or, or, or some other kind of malicious activity. Um, so to prevent against it, pretty much the strongest thing is going to be user awareness training, like making sure every, all of your employees and like you know what to look for. So you can kind of avoid and prevent phishing attacks. Some other controls to prevent it is some kind of email protection thing, like uh, exchange online protection would be one, like something that can kind of detect phishing from like many different ways and just filter the email. But of course, the most important thing is going to be user awareness training because something is like always going to get through and somebody might be phishing like on the phone, right? Or in person or something like this. So user awareness training is, in my opinion, going to be the, the strongest thing to prevent 
uh, phishing attacks. So this, this is a pretty good question. In my opinion, you should really be able to answer this well. And I kind of Googled it after the fact, top 10 ways to prevent phishing. And kind of like the things it lists out is like mostly stuff that the user can like do themselves like keep informed about phishing attacks, like think before you click like this, this kind of thing. So pretty much, you know, user, user like training and user awareness and user vigilance is like the number one, like, I guess the strongest control against most, like most cybersecurity attacks. So it's kind of good to acknowledge that and maybe mention it if you're ever asked this question. But yeah, that is what is phishing and how it can be prevented user awareness and user vigilance. And the next question is give some examples of web server vulnerabilities and how to prevent them. So some examples of, of web server vulnerabilities um, it kind of depends on if you're thinking like the, the web server itself or the web application or the website. But I'm going to assume this is talking about the web server itself. So the number I think I believe uh, the number one like vulnerability for web servers is if they're just unpatched. That's how like Equifax happened. And just something as simple as being unpatched makes it really easy for attackers to exploit it and take over the box, whether it's like making a web shell or just some other form of remote code execution. So probably the number one thing for web servers is if it's unpatched and it has, you know, live exploits that are like have been available in the wild for a while. Um, if we're talking about web apps and like websites, some examples would be some of the stuff you would see in OWASP top 10. So for example, like cross-site scripting attacks or some kind of injection attack, whether it's like a URL injection or SQL injection or, or some kind of a other injection where you're putting something in that's not intended to be there or some kind of overflow attack would be a good one. Or the web server like allowing you to upload files to it without actually checking the file is what it's supposed to be or without checking that the file has some kind of malicious payload in it. So this this is a pretty decent question. I'm not sure if, if you're uh, intended to answer about the web server, like the infrastructure itself or the stuff that's running on it. So I, I probably would have asked the interviewer like just to make sure. Um, but since this this specifically said uh, web server, you know, I just answered for vulnerabilities. Uh, but yeah, that is the the web server vulnerabilities question and the next question is how can organizations protect themselves from sql injection so sql injection is basically when you enter sql commands in like an input box and then you send it to the server and the server like processes it in an unintended way whether that's to return a bunch of records or drop a bunch of records or something like this so the best way to kind of prevent sql injection attacks is to do in server-side input validation that is before the server takes you know, the username or whatever was put in the input box before the server takes that and, and directly puts that into a SQL command, like the server needs to do some like back end validation. So like once the command gets to the server, the data gets to the server, that data that was entered by the user is then validated to make sure it doesn't already contain SQL, SQL commands or, or anything else, or maybe check the bounds on it to make sure it's not too long. If it contains like SQL comments or additional SQL commands, uh, filter that input and kind of give an error message back to the front end or something like this. So simply put, I would say just, you know, server side input validation is how to prevent SQL injection. Again, this is a pretty good question. I would, I would expect to see it uh, a lot because it's, it's, I think SQL injection is like number one on the OWASP top 10 anyway. So it's good to be aware of it and it's good to be aware of like how to mitigate and prevent it that's like i don't want to say like an easy question but it's like something that like every security person should be able to know and answer so make sure you know this one and then the next question and the last one for this section is explain how dns works so basically dns is used to convert host names into ip addresses that is instead of having to memorize like whatever the ip address for google is all you have to remember is google.com and then the computer or DNS rather, works through like a series of things to kind of figure out the IP address and then which allows your computer to go to the IP address on the internet and like request uh, the website from it. From your computer standpoint, when you go to like your browser and type www.google.com, first your computer will check its local DNS cache uh, to see if it has an entry for google.com. If it doesn't have an entry there, it will check the local host file. And if there's no entry in the local host file, it will then reach out to like whatever DNS server is configured on your network adapter. And it will ask that server like, hey, what's the IP address for google.com? And if that server doesn't know, it will 
it will essentially reach out to its server and then eventually like someone will know at least someone will know like what dot com is so maybe it will ask like the the group of servers who's responsible for handling dot com requests and dot com might not know but they'll be like well at least i know who google.com is and then it will refer that dns resolver to google.com and then maybe google.com is responsible or at least they know of you know the the endpoint or the server www so eventually like the ip address for www.google.com gets returned to your computer and then your your computer just reaches out to that ip address and then you know gets the the google web page so this is this is one of those questions where you can answer it in like a million different ways but i think you know as long as you say like if someone asks you how dns works depending on how you answer they can probably like gauge your technical ability i guess i'm not that good with dns I, I understand it like a basic level and I understand, you know, the, the kind of hierarchy, I guess, between like the, the cache and the host file and then like reaching out to the server and like iterative lookup and recursive lookup. But I, beyond that, like, I don't really know. I tried to explain like a, oh my gosh, I think it's a recursive lookup. I tried to explain one of those, but I didn't really explain it very eloquently. Um, but just keep that in mind. Like maybe you could learn something uh, from what I, how I answered this question. But if it's just like a basic job, like you're, a, you're an analyst, like a, tier one analyst or something as long as you say like it's used for you know resolving host names to ip addresses it's going to be like a good enough answer uh, but yeah i hope you enjoyed these uh questions again if i made any mistakes or anything like this uh, just let me know in the comments and I'll, I'll pin your comment um if it's bad enough i'll like re-upload the video but yeah i hope you enjoyed this uh please feel free to like and subscribe and we'll see you in the next one bye bye